Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here and to be part of this conversation. And of course, in Miracles, there is a line where it says that an idea grows stronger when it is shared. So when we have conversations like this and many minds are joined, many hearts, and we're considering these things, ideas do grow more resonant. Um, and that's an important thing going on in our culture right now, uh, particularly, uh, first of all, related to many things, but particularly related to health. We have a much higher uh, level of chronic illness in the United States than we do. They do in other countries, for instance, uh, advanced European countries. Um, when I was running for president, you might remember uh, that I made a point at the first uh, democratic debate uh, that while we, of course, need to talk about healthcare, we also need to realize that our healthcare system is a sickness care system, that what we really have to do is to ask ourselves, why are so many people sick here? Why do we have a, a higher rate of chronic illness? Why do we have more asthma, more heart disease, more obesity, um, <clears throat> and certain diseases such as that than they do in other uh, similarly advantaged countries? And of course, there's a political system in the United States that doesn't really want to go there. Because if we were to go there, we'd have to talk about certain causal factors regarding our food policies, regarding our chemical policies, regarding our agricultural policies and so forth. But I want to start today in a much more foundational place. I want to talk about healing from the inside out. And that has to do with metaphysics. Meta simply means greater than. So when we talk about metaphysics, we mean that which is greater than the physical world. And the reason from a metaphysical perspective, we have so many problems, we have so much breakdown in the material world is because we do not see the material world in a broader context. The material plane is one plane of our existence. There is the emotional plane, there is the psychological plane, and there is also the spiritual plane. Now, I say spiritual. Many people uh, think of metaphysics within a religious or a spiritual context. Some people see it within a secular context. It doesn't really matter for our purposes here. The idea is that there are objective discernible laws of internal phenomenon, just as there are objective discernible laws of the external world. If I drop my glass, I'm pretty sure it will fall on the floor and probably break into a lot of pieces. Now I can tell you that with certainty and you don't look at me and go, oh, her faith in gravity is really touching I don't have faith in gravity. I just know how gravity works. There are physical laws. There are metaphysical laws as well. And the primary metaphysical law is the law of cause and effect. Every action has a reaction. What we do comes back to us. And within the metaphysical realm, which is 180 degrees away from the material realm, just as in the material realm, if I give something, I no longer have it. In the non-material realm, I only have that which I give away and that which is withheld from others is withheld from myself. Now, the imprints of nature are the same within every realm. So the imprint of nature is that there is identity and purpose. Now, I, the, these, two, these are the two pillars of righteous living. Righteous means right use of the mind. When we are righteous, we are dwelling on the level of thought. And when we are dwelling on the level of thought in a righteous way, i.e. right use, the realm of the material world is the realm of effect. The realm of thought or metaphysics is the realm of cause. The realm of the material, the realm of physics is the realm of effect. The two pillars of righteousness are identity, and purpose. Metaphysically, we ask, excuse me, I'm sorry.
I apologize. I apologize. There's, there's noise outside my apartment. Please forgive me. So the idea is identity and purpose. The material world tells us that our identity is the body, our resume, what we have done, what we have not done, where we have succeeded, where we have failed, and what other people think about us. On the metaphysical realm, our identity is something very different. On the metaphysical realm, our identity is, well, if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, we are ideas in the mind of God. The mind of God being the energy of love, our being ideas in the mind of God, or seen religiously children of God, means that we are love. Not only is the metaphysical idea that we are love, but the metaphysical idea is that, as it says in The Course in Miracles, your physical birth was not the beginning of your life, but the continuation of your life. Your physical death is not the end of your life, but the continuation of your life. If I am spirit rather than material, that means that my life is much bigger than this one mortal incarnation. Now, within this realm of metaphysical identity is the idea that how I was created, and from a spiritual or, meta or, or religious perspective, meaning how I was created by God, I am changeless. And within that is an innocence in which I was created by God. I can make mistakes on this planet, and clearly we all do, but my mistakes do not alter the truth of who I am. Now, remember what I said. The level of thought is the level of cause. The realm of the material is the realm of effect. When I dwell within my body, knowing that I'm not my body, counterintuitively, that is the healthiest uh, perspective I can have on my body. Because the material world is programmed to work perfectly in alignment with metaphysical truth. It is when I over-identify with my body that my, I place a stress upon my body that the body was never meant to carry. And that is a source of sickness. We know how much uh, physical uh, sickness is associated with stress. Knowing that we are spirit rather than body is not a denial of the body. It's a recognition that within this three dimensions, not only does it exist, but it is a priceless container for our life experience. It is due respect. It is due gratitude. But the healthiest way to perceive the body and the healthiest way to treat the body is with an understanding that loading the body with thoughts that do not emanate from our spiritual reality actually is harmful towards the body. This is why forgiveness is healthy. This is why meditation is healthy. This is why prayer is healthy. All of those things lift the consciousness, lift our minds above the level of stress upon the body. And it actually creates a space where the body has an easier time falling into alignment. Now, the second metaphysical principle of righteousness has to do with purpose. Not only who we are, which puts us into right alignment with the body, but also why we are here. We are not here to just go out and do our thing. Let's look at how the physical body operates. And remember what I said, that the patterns of nature are the same in both material and non-material reality. In the physical body, the, the cells are all informed. Each cell carries with it a natural intelligence. The intelligence which says, you go to the pancreas, you go to the lungs, you go to the blood, you go to the bones. When this natural intelligence carries the cells to their assigned place, 
Their highest level of intelligence once they get there is collaborative. The cell is there to collaborate with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which it is their part. Every once in a while, for reasons that scientists understand to some extent and do not understand to other extents, a cell disconnects from its natural intelligence. It goes off to do its own thing. I don't wanna serve the healthy functioning of the pancreas. I wanna go off and do my own thing. And I'm gonna surround myself with other cells who have been similarly disconnected from their collaborative function. And we're gonna build our own little kingdom. That's a tumor. That's what cancer is. That's a malignancy and it is a destructive element. That is what has happened to the human race. We have been infected by a malignant consciousness. The malignant thought, which is the same as the cancerous cell in the body, the thought, hey, I'm only here to do my own thing. I'm not here to collaborate with you to serve the whole thing that's bigger than us. No, 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 no. I want to do my own thing. I'm going to go wherever I just feel like going and doing whatever I want to do. What does this do to the body? It is destructive to the body and it is destructive to the body politic. And that is the cancer. That is the metaphysical cancer that has infected the human race. We've forgotten. We're here with a purpose. We're here to collaborate with one another to serve the whole. If you're a scientist, to serve the organ, which is science. If you're an artist, to serve the organ that is the arts. If you're a business person, to serve the organ that is business. If you're, no matter what field you're in, you're here to collaborate with others in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which we are part. Not doing so, we have harmed ourselves in society, just as a cell that forgets its collaborative function harms the body. Going back to our chemical policies, going back to our food policies, going back to the water policies. What is the thinking? What is the thinking? Now you could argue that back in the 50s and the 60s, they really didn't know the damage monocropping would do to the topsoil. It could be argued that in the 50s and the 60s, they really didn't know the damage that these pesticides would do. It could be argued that back in the 50s and the 60s, they didn't really know the damage of all the chemicals in these water. They've known it for decades though, ladies and gentlemen. They've known for decades. But in order to make more money, well, it's that for a cancer. That's a cancer that begins in thought that somebody making more money is more important that our food be than that our food be healthy. That somebody make more money is more important than our topsoil lasts for more than a few decades. That somebody makes more money is more important than that our water is 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 purified of just extraordinary amounts of toxic chemicals, more than the average person realizes. That somebody makes more money, therefore we spend so much more of our resources on, on ways to destroy each other than ways to uplift each other. It is a consciousness in our mind. And then it plays out, why are we selling Roundup? Why are we selling those pesticides that we absolutely know harm a developing child's brain? And on and on and on. That is why we are now living at a time when people understand that just as we have a health and wellness sector now in terms of the physical body, we must now develop and are beginning to develop a health and wellness sector uh, that affects the collective. I've been saying to people for so many years, good luck with all that green juice, good luck with all that gluten-free, they're poisoning the air you're breathing. They're poisoning the water that you're drinking. They're poisoning the food you're eating unless you spend, unless you have enough money that every single thing you eat is from some kind of top-notch organic purified of all artificial flavors, et cetera, store or, or product. 
And so today we are realizing, I think this is happening, that we are realizing that you cannot separate the me from the we. You can't protect the me for very long if you're not addressing the we. That at a certain point, no matter what the public issue is, it will get to your private door. There are so many ways. And I think that this has been true, to be honest, within the health and wellness community. Sort of siloed ourselves over here. It's been more convenient. We didn't want to have to do with all this toxic stuff out there and politics and so forth. But we now realize that pandemic is a perfect example. Anything that is disharmonious in the larger world is now going to touch all of our lives. When I said earlier that meditation helps the physical body, one of the reasons it not only is healthy for the physical body, one of the reasons it is also healthy and helpful for the collective is because it's one thing to accept, you know, we've talked about these two pillars, who am I and what am I here for? Those are the two existential questions. You handle that, your life is gonna be so much better in any situation. Who am I in this situation and why am I here? And if you go, I am an individualized expression of the love that heals all things, and I'm here to extend that love. I'm not here to think about just what I'm going to get. I'm here to think about what I'm going to give. I'm not just here to think about myself. I'm here to think about everyone else. I'm here to be an immune cell in this wounded body of humanity. Then the issue is not only knowing that, but meditating every day as a way of receiving your instruction. In The Course in Miracles, it says that every morning we're to pray, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? Somebody was putting in the chat just now about eating meat. Industrialized uh, farm, uh, animal farms is a, is a perfect example. It is insane. It is non-loving. It is cruel. So we should not be surprised it is unhealthy for the body. We have behaved without reverence to animals. We've behaved without reverence to the earth. We behave without reverence to children. We behave without reverence to other, just to the concept of other people on the planet, reverence to our own bodies. And therefore, we are experiencing both on the mental level of our own traumas, as well as on the physical level of our bodily illnesses. We are experiencing the breakdown, the sickness, and the disease that are simply a reflection of the places within our own minds where we have deviated from our collaborative function. It is in remembering who we are. Now in a religious and spiritual sense, the Course in Miracles says that you think you have many different problems, but you really only have one, and that is your separation from God. In any given moment, who am I? Why am I here? And when we apply that, not only to our individual behavior, but to our collective behavior, there is no, there's no reason public policy can't be an expression of love. It's pretty simple. The part of the game is they try to make it like it's complicated. It's actually not. You see a hungry child, you feed them. You see an uneducated child, you educate them. You see a person not giving a, given a fair shot in an educational or economic system, you fix that. You treat people with justice and you treat people with mercy and you act humbly before some higher power. That is as relevant to our collective behavior, which is all the political policy is, as to our individual selves. And we don't deny it when it comes to our individual lives. And we should stop denying it when it comes to our collective lives. And all of the people who say, oh, you can't act that way because your economy wouldn't be healthy as though it's healthy now. Because all that that does is to protect a system where 1% of people are living pretty, pretty well. And all of us know if you're in that club, boy, life's good. Not enough people can get into the club right now. And that's not just dangerous, it is sick and it is unsustainable. 
It's as though all the blood and the body was in one arm. Blood has to circulate and so does money and so does opportunity. And when blood circulates and when there's intelligence of the brain and intelligence of the heart working together, guess what? You have a healthier body. And when we allow opportunity to circulate and justice to circulate and mercy to circulate and reverence to circulate and care for the young, you know, any woman who's been pregnant can tell you, there's a really strange experience you have when you carry a child. It is so clear that nature favors the baby. And if your bladder has to get pushed over, your bladder is going to get pushed over. You can feel it viscerally that, the, the, that nature is supporting that new life. And when we are aligned with natural thinking in the society, we look at children the same way. When there's nothing sicker than withholding opportunities from your young. Look at any species. And it's worth noting that in every species, one of the characteristics of any mammalian species that th thrives and survives is the fierce behavior on the part of the adult female when she senses a threat to her cubs. So women should be leading the charge, get those chemicals out of the food, get those pesticides out of there, regenerative agriculture, everything else that's needed to get the carbon emissions out of the air, all of the things that at this point we all know. Now, the issue is, will the immune system set in? You know, the body can take a, a large amount of uh, assault and injury and sickness if the immune system is healthy. And a civilization can take a lot of assault and injury too if the immune system is healthy. One of the reasons we have so many problems in our society is because we have not been healthy immune systems, you and I, the individual cells, the individual citizens have not, have not kept our eyes on the ball. We have been distracted from the issues of we because we've been, we've been trained to be malignant in that sense. It's all about me. It's all about me. Well, it's not just all about you in the body or in the civilization, but we're awakened. There's an awakening now. And I think the immune system is being activated, but it's an all hands on deck, all systems breakdown, all systems solution type of moment. So I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak into this listening, knowing that there's so much information here. You know, that's the thing that's so profound today. Each and every one of us has a passion for a place where we could serve, where we could help enliven and awaken. And each and every one of us, because of events like this and because of the proliferation of this kind of material, also are getting the information we need about food, about all of the things that we need to have healthier bodies, to have healthier souls. And now it's our job to go out and to create a healthier society. So thank you so much. And uh, if you'd like to ask questions now, I'm gonna put on my headphones so that uh, so that uh, we can do that. And uh, if that's what you'd like, then that would be fine with me, Ben. Marianne, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm personally very moved. I know our audiences as well. As everyone can see on the screen, of course, for more information about Marianne Williamson's activities and programs and, and books, you can visit Marianne.com. That is the best place to go. So we encourage you to do that for sure. And so as far as questions go, yes, here's what we're going to do, Marianne. We're going to ask everybody who's who's watching and, and is interested, if you haven't already seen it in the chat box, we're not able to take questions directly from the chat box. But what we do is we have you raise your hand and we take the questions of raised hands as they come in in, in that order. How do you do that? You click on the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So anybody that has a reactions tab, for some people it might be the participants tab, but mostly the reactions tab. When you click that, a little raise hand button pops up. You click raise hand. We will see it and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So once we go ahead and select you, I will let you know. We'll ask you to unmute 
And, uh, and we ask you to keep your questions brief and direct for Marianne as well. So that said, I see a couple coming in. Are you ready to go? Marianne, you're all set, right? Oh, great. Okay, I think we still have you muted. <laughs> yeah, sure. Of course I am. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so up first, we have Bailey. Bailey, go ahead, right ahead and, and let's have your question. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Marianne. I think everything you say is lovely. You talked about compassion to animals. So I'm wondering why you personally are not vegan. Well, I don't know if my goal would be to be vegan, definitely vegetarian. I try to lean in that direction. And, uh, I, you know, the time that I achieved it, uh, there was a spiritual clarity um, that was undeniable. So if you would argue that it's a sort of higher state of being, I don't disagree with you. When I got there, I got there actually, it was back in the 1980s, I think the 80s, probably the late 80s. And there was a, a, um, an Indian guru, an Indian spiritual teacher. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And uh, she, I, somebody told me that I should go, that she'd have a private session with me. I went to this apartment and I remember it was in Beverly Hills and I thought she was going to give me all this wisdom. And from the very beginning, all she did was tell me that I could not eat animals and that I must not eat animals and that I must not eat animals. And I sat there feeling very um, uh, annoyed by her. Like this isn't what I came here for. And she just wouldn't stop. And she just kept telling me not to eat animals and telling me not to eat animals and telling me not to eat animals. I don't know everything she said. I remember getting increasingly frustrated. This is clearly all she wanted to talk to me about. I left there after, I don't know what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever. And the next conscious memory that I had was standing in my kitchen on Hayworth Avenue in West Hollywood with a bucket of Kentucky Colonel fried chicken. Now, I was not someone who would even, even then, would eat Kentucky Colonel Fried Chicken. And I had, a, I was like, what am I doing? And I got, it's the last meat you'll ever eat. She had done something to me. She had transmitted to me. She zapped me. And I was lifted. And I couldn't bear the thought of eating an animal. I couldn't even bear, I would go to a restaurant and I would see even people eating an egg and I would be like, I couldn't even, I, 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 I had just been taken there. And I will grant to you, it was the happiest and most clear I'd ever been in my life. About a month later, I was at a restaurant with my boyfriend in New York City and I fainted and I was in the hospital what had happened here was I had learned nothing. I had just been taken to a place where I uh, was, wasn't eating animals, but I hadn't learned anything. I didn't cultivate any knowledge. When I got back after they gave me the electrolytes or what, what, is, what happens when you don't have what you need from protein or whatever it was. And I remember going to my various natural doctors, et cetera. And I let them all convince me that this vegetarian and vegan thing is very nice, but your ancestry, you know, you're a Polish Jew and that's that, blah, blah, blah. And I was never, and this is not an excuse, but I was never able to get back on myself, by myself. So if you want to, to tell me the, um, uh, the political reasons, the uh, health reasons or any others, uh, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. Uh, I have never made it back to that place of uh, complete absence of animal protein. And that's my story. Thank you for that, Marianne. We appreciate that. And um, I'm gonna bring up next uh, somebody named Joe. I have a feeling I know this guy. Joe, go ahead and unmute yourself if you would for Marianne Williams. Yes, hi. Ben, you're doing a great job. Uh, Marianne, it's so beautiful to have you part of the Thank you. conference. Um, your message sort of rounds out what I feel the conference needs. And um, uh, I've become more of a follower of, of your message as a result of what you did in your political world. Thank you. Um, and uh, that blew me away. I'm not going to kid you. Thank you. The things that you said 
had never been said before on a national forum like that. And the responses from my observation were like, did they pick up on what she just said? And the answer was obviously no, they never did. But I'm glad you just kept saying them. So that, that, was, that was really good. Um, <clears throat> my, I guess my question here is that um, sort of living the way you talk about, and I'm, I can always improve in that. And I love hearing because I, I constantly want to tweak my life and, and fulfill, I guess, why I'm here. And um, my, my interaction, and um, I, I think you used the word something like, you know, your, your purpose with collaboration is very important to me. And I've been doing that. So I was like, I was like, yes, I collaborate. You know, I do my work and I collaborate. Um, uh, what I've noticed recently in my uh, collaboration is that people's belief system is paper thin. Um, many people that I talk to and, and I try not to exploit that because I potentially could and do the damage that that lady did to you when you met with her on the veganism thing, you know, so I'm very sensitive about that, but I, I feel like, um, there's not a lot of foundation. And when I give them really good nuggets coming from my heart um, with compassion, understanding that their consciousness isn't there, I find that, um, you know, I, I get a better response from people. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I want to say that woman did not do damage to me. I think she served me greatly. So I don't look at that woman as having damaged me. I think that woman <laughs> serves me. Um, I think that we are living in a very unfortunate moment. A democracy and freedom means nobody has a monopoly on the truth. Everybody has something to add here. And we're afraid to talk to each other these days because it's too, do you, you meet people who disagree with you and instead of saying, oh, I see it differently, they say not only, are you wrong, but you should shut up. I mean, there's something very scary in the air these days. We have to return each and every one of us for, to greater respect for people with whom we do not agree. And that includes those of us in the spiritual community. When you say, even when you say the phrase, their consciousness is not there yet, it's a kind of spiritual superiority that sometimes we feel. And I've known people in my life uh, the universe has slapped me down pretty great at times. Yeah, Marianne, maybe you have some metaphysical stuff uh, uh, figured out that they don't, but they were just kinder than you were. So with all your talk about love, uh, that person just demonstrated more forgiveness than you did. So I think that when it's really at the deepest level, what we are communicating is what we're demonstrating not just data, including metaphysical data, but consciousness, how are we actually treating people? That is a method of conversion. If you want to, if you want to help people open their hearts, open your hearts to them. You don't get people to open their heart by telling them they should open their heart. You get people to open their heart by having your heart more open to you. Now, you might not see the result of their open-heartedness and it might not be demonstrated to you, but that's not what matters. It might be after you leave the room. It might be after you have any contact with them. You will still be blessed though, because remember what I said earlier, you only get to keep what you give away. So if you demonstrate more of an open heart to anyone, which includes respect, particularly almost these days for people who do not agree with us, you know, uh, I know for many of us, the, um, the Trump years were uh, difficult in this way. Uh, I have one girlfriend, a rather close girlfriend, who um, was a Trump supporter and I was not. And I think now that those years are over, I think we both feel sort of proud of ourselves. We worked hard at protecting our relationship. We worked hard at it. There were times when we both at the beginning, you know, we would, 
and we would hold back, you know, she's been good to my child. And I think she feels like I've been there good to her children. She's been there to, with me in some of my saddest moments. I've been there for her in her sad moments. And we knew that there was something much more important than, than, than Donald Trump that we needed to protect. And uh, I think, uh, I know, I think we both grew from it. And I think both, even though we haven't overtly discussed it, I think we're both really grateful that the relationship survived at that time and, and we've, we worked it. We, we had to work on it. Um, it takes, you know, we've all read Marshall Rosenberg and we know about nonviolent communication skills. Uh, none of us have a monopoly on truth. All of us, um, you know, anytime we think we got the answer and they don't, and if they're so cool, you know, especially if they're so spiritual, why don't they agree with us? Nothing is less spiritual than thinking that if people are really spiritual, they should agree with you. None of us have a monopoly on truth. Thank you for that. And uh, up next, we have Kelly. Kelly, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, we'd love to have your question for Maria. Okay, I'll be brief, but I'm really enjoying your eloquency, your faith, very practical and logical, very humane. And I just wanted to know, um, how long do you pray? How, I mean, when do you pray? How long do you meditate? And what do you meditate about? In the Course in Miracles, no, not just in the Course in Miracles, in any religious, serious religious or spiritual um, system that I have ever read about or known anything about, um, there is emphasis placed on the morning. When you wake up in the morning is when your mind is most open to receive the sort of worldly download. If you go immediately to television, computer, phone, newspaper, you're downloading the consciousness of the world, which is very fear-laden particularly today. It's very, very important in those, before you go to the thinking of the world, go to the thinking of God. I am a Course in Miracles student, and I also do transcendental meditation, but no, there are many, you know, there's one truth spoken many different ways. If you don't know what your particular meditation or prayer path would be, which it sounds like perhaps you don't, I promise you, if you ask in your heart, books will fall in your feet at your feet within two or three days. I wrote a book called The Return to Love, which is sort of like the cliff notes of A Course in Miracles. You might feel moved to, open, uh, 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 to do that. You might feel moved to go to Marianne.com where I, I, you can actually get the 365 day, days of meditation exercises into your inbox. But there's Buddhist meditation, there's uh, uh, Islamic meditation, there is uh, other Christian and Christic meditations, there is, um, you know, and there's the, all the mindfulness stuff out there these days that, that stays in a more secular context. With today's world, you get on, on, on the internet, uh, I promise you, um, you can find it. The thing about, about The Course in Miracles that I love is that it is a very specific curriculum that has to do with uh, relinquishing and dismantling a thought system of fear and, and substituting a thought system of love. Any serious uh, meditation practice will include some kind of mantra like that, some kind of sound sentence or something. It, is, it goes beyond relaxation. You know, a lot of people say, well, I meditate walking through the woods. Well, actually, no, you don't, because that's relaxing and beautiful and fabulous and healing. And I'm not in any way minimizing that. But meditation is a practice where your brain literally emits it from brain waves, And that includes an actual technique. There are many of them. Um, when you ask me how long, when you do transcendental meditation, it is uh, 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. In The Course in Miracles, it starts with about a minute and it builds up to five minutes an hour, it builds up to 15 minutes twice a day and so forth. But the practice that is correct for you will appear in your life and seek, seek to follow it and remember what I said about the morning. Thank you for that. And uh, up next, we have Ginger. Ginger, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself for Marianne Williamson. Hi, um, I have a point of view towards vegetarianism or veganism um, that's, uh, and I'm curious about your reaction. Uh, I um, am just uh, emotionally unable 
to kill animals, including uh, worms. Even from my early childhood, when my mother would garden, I would, I didn't want to be there because I didn't want to see a worm get cut up by a spade. And so when I became an adult, somebody uh, persuaded me to become a vegetarian. Uh, this was 50 years ago. Um, and, but I didn't, like you, I guess, I didn't really know the ins and outs of it. I didn't, nobody told me to take vitamin B12, et cetera. Um, but I, I finally developed a, the position that if I couldn't kill an animal, I didn't have the right to eat it. So I really am opposed mostly to um, farm-raised animals, um, uh, less so those that are allowed to roam free. Um, but I have no problem with people who hunt. I couldn't do it, yeah. so I don't eat it. Yeah. But I don't have a problem with other people doing it. Um, so what I can do uh, emotionally is I can steal an egg from a chicken um, and therefore I eat eggs. Um, I'm I just, understand yeah. what you're saying. And uh, I think what you're saying is a very evolved position. I think that whether or not someone, um, uh, this is obviously an individual decision that people make, but I do think that collectively we have a right to uh, oppose and to oppose vigorously uh, cruelty to animals. And animal factory farms are cruel. And animal factory farming should end. And that's, I believe, something that is bubbling up in the culture. Um, I certainly carried it forward in my presidential campaign and will continue to do that. Many people do, obviously. Um, animal factory farming should absolutely end. I think your, your personal position on animals is very evolved and I admire it very greatly. Thanks, Marianne. And up next we have, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Gabrielle, uh, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, my name is Gabriela. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's German, so it's a little hard to pronounce. Um, I wanted to tell you that I have really enjoyed, I, I haven't read your book, and today is the first I've heard of you, so that's okay. But I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. And really felt touched by pretty much everything you said. But the reason I wanted to comment was because I liked your answer when, I don't know who the person was, that asked you, why are you not vegan? Mm -hmm. And may I state that the way it was asked, I took offense to because my, I'm vegan, but I was vegetarian since I was 21. I'm 65. I was 20, at 21, I became a vegetarian and I've been a vegetarian until I was 63. At 63, I became a vegan. So that's only two years. Um, but my children are not vegans and they're not vegetarians either. And they claim, well, I'm not trying to make excuses for my children, but one of the main reasons that they have not embraced it is because of the sanctified manner of many, many, many vegans. And I remember even a couple of years ago, a friend, I was running with someone and he was saying, oh, I just can't wait to get home from this run. I'm going to have a big, fat, juicy steak. Don't you think that sounds great? I'm like, ah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, well, actually, I'm a vegan. And he stopped running and looked at me. He says, no, you're not. And I'm like, yes, I am. He says, no, you're not. You're too nice. <laughs> he said, I'm like, what do you mean by that? He says, well, uh, a vegetarian has that attitude of, I don't eat meat and neither do you. <laughs> and he's, he just couldn't believe that I don't do that. And so I really like your answer because, you know, you don't have the right to judge other people. Yeah. There's a lot of spiritual superiority in that, in that particular corner. You're right. And it's very off putting to a lot of people. Um, and I agree with you, more people would be vegan uh, at this point, probably if, yeah, 
there's a woman named Kathy Freston. She's a friend of mine and she writes books about it. She always just says to me, just lean in, Marianne, just lean in. She's always so forgiving and so helpful. And uh, she demonstrates the attitude that I believe uh, you're speaking to, which is, um, I, I don't have a problem with the proselytizing, but there is a difference between proselytizing and an aggressive uh, judgmental, which as you can imagine in my work, I get, well, if she was really spiritual. I mean, it was even here in the chat. Yeah, if she was really spiritual, she'd be vegan. Okay, well, if you were, I could just as easily say, if you were really spiritual, you would be working your ass off for political change. So, you know, why, why don't we, you know, why don't we just kind of, decide that the judgment of other people's path is really not the spiritual process at all. Thank you for that. And um, up next, we have Benny with a question. Great name. Hi, Benny. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Benny, if you can check in, we just want to have you unmute yourself so we can hear your question from Marianne. Benny, I love your name, but throw me... Uh, <laughs> I tell you what, we'll, we'll give Benny one more chance right after this, but let's move on to uh, Joanne. Joanne, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, we'll have our tech team send you a note, I think, too. Here we go. Hi, Joanne. Hi there. So, um, hi, Marianne. Hi. I love you. I know you for many, many years <laughs> since I'm a young girl. We um, just have we've been around. We've all known each other for a long time. <laughs> Um, and you look gorgeous. Um, so I seem to be, <laughs> I don't know, I seem to be in some kind of setback. <laughs> um, <laughs> just <laughs> I'm having a, um, a tough time with um, so many losses in my life. Um, and <laughs> being alone, I have no children, no parents, no siblings, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I have so many gifts. I'm, I'm a talented artist. I do portraits, beautiful portraits. People always like ooh and ah with them, and... Um, and I cut hair and uh, did that in Trump Tower. Sorry about the Trump name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, just, you know, have a lot of gifts that I want to manifest. And it just seems like, I don't know, like so much time I get um, caught up in setbacks with, with losses or or, you know, traumas from my childhood being reignited. Um, you once suggested meditation to me when uh, at Omega when I was about 45 years old. We were about 45 years old. <laughs> and um, I just have not been able to take to them. You know, I am a plant-based organic vegan and um, my body just doesn't seem to do well with anything that isn't natural. So I don't know, do you know, I guess my question is, do you know anything out there that has been effective to help people who came from severely abusive backgrounds and have had like, a play I've lost two friends of 30 years. I lost my husband of 35 years. I lost I my, you know, all three of my brothers. Yeah. So, um, you know, is there anything out there that really works? <laughs> yes, there are a million things out there that work. Uh, what is your name again? Joanne. Okay, so this is the deal, Joanne. They all work if you work them. The Course in Miracles works, they all work. Gabor Mate's work, work. There are so many modalities out there for healing your life, but nothing's going to work unless you work it. And there's nothing that's going to work unless you make some dip, some changes along the line of what I was saying here today. Who am I and why am I here? I'm not in any way diminishing uh, or minimizing the trauma of your abusive childhood. But at the same time, I remind you that we are all wounded. 
And there is a point at which we decide whether or not to act from the wound. Uh, too many people are waiting till the wound is healed before they show up for the planet. You can't be happy in today's world unless you're showing up for the planet and we do not have enough time for everybody to wait until they're enlightened masters to do so. That is just a trick of the ego mind. And I also wanna remind you, Joanne, that what you, I assume you're an American or you live in a Western democracy. Yeah, I live here in New York. All right, so I would remind you that what you and I have to worry about is nothing compared to what women in Afghanistan might have to worry about soon, what women in Saudi Arabia have to worry about, what women in many societies have to worry about if, if they try to exercise a fraction of the abilities that you and I can take for granted. So there is grace and grit, a softening and a toughening up that is called for right now. Where this has been a really rough time in the loneliness and isolation department. But there are also many people you can help. Many ways that you can wake up in the morning. Sometimes I tell myself, you know, with everything that I practice, et cetera, sometimes it's simply as a matter of attitudinally throwing cold water on my face. Marianne, get over yourself. Get up, take a shower, get dressed, get over yourself. Don't think about you. Who can you help today? What part, if, if you're lonely, Marianne, what Google could you be on? What Zoom? Where could you be doing something giving? Because what happens is that we, the ego mind, would have us um, almost embellish the wound. And there is a level of decision. There is a level of decision. And, and I know about this. I wrote a book called Tears to Triumph. I know what depression feels like. I know what emotional moods are, are like. I, you know, there's that Simon and Garfunkel song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. But I also know there's some attitudinal choices that I have to make. And it can't be just which, which modality would work. They will all work if I work them, but no matter what, until we're at the level of enlightened master, it's gonna be hard sometimes. And COVID has been hard. And if, if, if you're lonely, you have to look at the ways you isolate. You have to look at the ways you're choosing not to participate. And it's not a denial of the wound, but it is a denial of the power of the wound to hold you back. We have a democracy at stake. We have a planet at stake right now. And, and one of the most dangerous risks to the world is if we have become so soft and self-indulgent that we are not, that we would not be willing to act in spite of our pain. And what I've learned, Joanne, is that there are a lot of hours in the day. Go out into the world, do what you can, kick ass, Marianne, give what skills and talents you have. And when you come home later tonight, if you have to spend an hour crying into your pillow or processing your stuff, you'll get to do that too. But not right now, because your country needs you and your great, great grandchildren need you. And I tell you something, Sometimes that's the best advice I can give myself. It's hard, but it's nothing hard for you, Marianne, compared to what some people on this planet are going through. I tell myself that I'm being self-indulgent and, um, and that there's so much I need to do to make a contribution. And I, I just don't, I don't know. It's just another way of beating. It feels like another way of beating myself up for not, now, you know, sometimes uh, there is such thing. you know, it's funny. Uh, that's an interesting thing that your, your mind will come up with. The issue is if you're, if you're telling yourself, I'm being self-indulgent, maybe you should listen to yourself in that moment. You know, we coddle our neuroses too much in our society today, Joanne, and a lot of that came from our community. We coddle it in ourselves. We coddle it in each other. And I'm not minimizing your, your wounding. I'm not, I'm not minimizing it. I'm not diminishing uh, uh, what terrible trauma has done. But I also know that, you know, I've known people who, you know, one of my heroes is a woman I, I knew, she died a couple years ago, two years in Auschwitz. And lived to succeed, triumph, victorious in every way, it can happen. So you're not alone right now because we're all here with you. And we all, 
I, I know I speak for everybody listening to you right now, compassion for your pain, not minimizing your pain, and saying, please join us because this is a critical time on the planet. And there is a part that only you can play, Joanne. You said you're a writer. You said you, 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 you told us the gifts you have. Maybe it's taking a walk right now. You said you live in New York. Maybe it's getting out of the apartment, going, God will lead you. But sometimes you have to make a decision. I will not allow myself. I, I know what this is like. I'm a, I'm a double cancer. People know astrology. And I can watch myself spiral down. And, and there is an art form to how you go through it. Okay, Marianne, I will create the space. You can be in a bad mood. And you will, con you will, you will there's that place where honoring your pain turns into indulging your pain. Where processing your pain becomes spewing your pain. And all of us are like working on finding that sweet spot where we're honoring ourselves, but not indulging ourselves. You're just like the rest of us. So right now, what I'm going to suggest is that we all pray with Joanne, because I think that everybody can relate to what Joanne is saying. So right now, we dare God, join with Joanne and we surrender to you her burdens. We surrender to you her pain, we surrender to you her suffering. And we place in your hands our own as well. And we take this moment to remember all those who suffer on this planet. Billions and billions of people who are experiencing terrible suffering and our hearts, we open our hearts in this moment in profound compassion. And we join with Joanne in asking, please show us how we can help. And so it is together, we all say, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Great message for all of us. When in doubt, focus out. That's a great one. When in doubt, focus out. So true. Marianne, my wife gets the credit for that one. Benny now. Um, Benny, if we can get you to unmute, I am sourcing. It's going to work this time. Benny, if you can hit your unmute button. <laughs> Benny, you're throwing me under the bus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Benny! <laughs> um, Benny is off with the Jets, as they say. So ah. let's, uh, let's move on to uh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, uh, if, yes, thank you for unmuting, Michelle. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Marianne, it's just such an honor to uh, see you here today. You were the very first a uh, spiritual teacher that I encountered when I went through my own awakening. And I think I saw you 20 years ago in Toronto. Um, I mean, um, and before I ask my question, I just want to say as a Canadian who is observing all of the U S political situation over the last few years, um, I obviously recognized you immediately when you joined the race. And I was so incredibly impressed Thank you. Um, and delighted to see you enter um, that space and the fact that you remained completely unchanged in terms of who you are and how you presented yourself to the world. Um, and, and I think that even though you didn't win in that regard, you won um, because you changed the consciousness. I, I could see it the way that even the way that the other candidates were responding. Um, they, they started to borrow your language. <laughs> so um, we're so, healing the soul of America, are we? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, the question <laughs> I have you is you. Um, I, I work in a very precarious uh, position where I work in my private practice um, in holistic nutrition um, and energy healing. But I also work in the allopathic medical world in the hospital based system. And I, I'm kind of surrounded by both sets of views of the pandemic. And I, I like to think, um, lar due largely to listening to your spiritual teaching over the years, to be open-minded to what everyone has to say and to make up my own mind about things. But faced with the ideas that are 
constantly put in front of me of incredible devious conspiracy, um, you know, from, from, from the worst fears of humanity. Um, where I try to elevate myself to and those around me is that even if that's true, and I'm not saying it is because I'm not sure I believe that, but even if it was true, the power of love is so much stronger and the power of our consciousness and, and binding together is a community to support one another with the solutions that we have in front of us is always going to win. That, that's, that's the mentality I try to continuously elevate my consciousness to. Um, I remember your quote, um, which is often misquoted ironically, but our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I just wonder what, how, how you deal with this and, and what your thoughts are. And that's where, that's where I try to, to live from. Um, but I'd really love to hear from you. Exactly what you just said. I hear it all. I hear it all. And there are very few people who represent something that I feel that's the truth or truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I hear things and I go, you know, and uh, I know that ultimately it's what you said, that the answer is the same no matter what. No matter what's going on, the answer that love is stronger and love is greater. And that if we continue to build the consciousness of love for one another, and the, the righteousness that I spoke of, and each of us playing the part that God would have us play, the God of our understanding, then all walls will fall. So some of what I hear these days, I, you know, some of it, uh, some of it, I, I don't know what to think. Others of it, uh, um, I'm certainly not over with the, you know, certainly not with the QAnon crowd or any craziness like that. Um, I think that we're living in very chaotic times, obviously. And uh, I think that the, the issue is less to analyze the problem sometimes and more to be the solution as God would have you be. And regardless of, I think that the quote unquote conspiracy that we have to worry about is nothing covert, it's quite overt. It's that due to the undue influence of money on our political system, we have a cor corporate matrix of health insurance companies and uh, big pharmaceutical companies, uh, gun manufacturers, chemical companies, food companies, uh, agricultural companies, fossil fuel companies, and defense contractors who are able to dominate our public policies in ways that are at the expense of the safety and health and well-being of the American people and the, um, the planet on which we live. And given the current makeup of the Supreme Court, uh, it's not reasonable to assume that we can overturn Citizens United anytime soon. And Citizens United was a decision that gave uh, uh, all this uh, uh, permission for hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, unduly influence our public policy. The only antidote to that is an awakened citizenry. And in the presence of an awakened citizenry, all of this will change. Anything less, it will not. And that is what we should be concentrated on, in my opinion. Thank you for that, Marianne. And uh, we actually, uh, we spoke with Joanne earlier, and Joanne's back. Joanne, we're gonna have you unmute. Uh, sounds like you may have another question for Marianne. So Joanne, again, if you can unmute yourself. <coughs> hmm, am I wrong? Oh, yeah, there we go. hi. Um, I, I, really, uh, I really didn't have another question. I don't know how my hand got up, sorry. Well, we're all rooting for you, Joanne, I can tell you that. That's right. Thank you, Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. And so with that, uh, Marianne Williamson, uh, oh, we do have one more question, let's see. It is uh, David. David, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Marianne. Thanks for taking my uh, my question. Okay, I was listening back and forth about the political climates. People didn't like Trump, uh, Biden, all this stuff. I I understand that there's a lot of division here. Um, but one thing I'm curious about is that you mentioned about these corporate interests. And I know, obviously, under Trump, people didn't like it. But under previous presidents, regardless on which side of the aisle people are on, it seems to be that the corporations generally, like big air, big pharma, 
always have some kind of control over the election process and over politics. So if, if we're talking about, let's say, uh, every, people, more people should use love as a tool, let's say, to, but if there's so much hatred out there for, you know, there was so much hatred for Trump, Republicans, conservatives, and then this hatred for one side for the other, and that hatred is very palpable. I saw it more in this election cycle than I did in 2016, and then I did in 2000, back in 2000 when Bush versus Gore. It seems to be very palpable, and, and there's a lot of angry people. There's a lot of protesting. People are upset about inequalities that are taking place. They want to even things out. But from my point of view, it, it just seems to me that, at the, that the players at the top, these large corporations, always remain the same. And it's just a matter of, let's say, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And it's a matter of, it's just, people are kind of pawns on a chessboard. You know, you say, you claim one problem, fix another. Like, you know, for example, in New York City, you say, you know, obviously we want a policing to be better. And, you know, the, the, we feel that maybe there's racism, whether there is or isn't. The number of shootings here in New York City is way up. And in the very areas of places where they want to make equality, the people in those areas are getting shot at, at rates that we haven't seen in many years. And it just seems to me that it's always even at the top. And they use the, the kind of, I don't want to call people pawns, but by sowing discord between people, it allows the people at the top to continue doing what they're doing and saying, well, we really want to help you. We're, we're trying our best, even though for the last 50 years, they've been saying in, in, you know, in New York City, we want equality, we want equality. And problems are still there. But I wanted to hear your take on the, the top versus the like I said, an informed citizenry, all of the, the top interests versus the citizenry. I believe the top is playing to the ear saying, yes, we hear you, we hear you, we want to change things, and they don't. Okay. And what happens is you had a lot of protests and there was yeah, we get there is achievements, but there's also okay. destruction. Okay. Between World War II uh, and 1980, America built an extraordinary middle class. In the 1970s, the average American had a good job with good benefits, could own a home, could own a car, could take a yearly vacation, could send their kids to school, to, to college. That was the average American worker in the 1970s. And we had a very different tax structure. We had far greater taxes for the very, very richest among us. And there were uh, national governmental programs such as the building the highway system that were not seen as socialist left-wing craziness, but were just seen as government doing its job. I remind you that the president, uh, when all that was happening in the 1950s, was a Republican, Dwight Eisenhower. It was in 1980 that there was elected a president who introduced the notion of trickle-down economics. The notion that the primary responsibility of the corporation should be fiduciary financial responsibility to its stockholders at the expense of other stakeholders, that the most important thing was to increase stockholder value, and that would lead to squeezing money from the worker. It would lead to a diminished uh, sense of responsibility to the workers, to the community, and to the, to the planet itself, which should be considered the other stakeholders. What was, what was presented to people was that this was good because these stockholders would become job creators and the money would trickle down and lift all boats. Now, after 40 years, it's clear, the jury's in after 40 years, trickle down economics did not lift all boats. It actually left millions and millions and millions of people without even a life vest. And it caused a massive transfer of wealth into the hands of 1% of Americans who now control more wealth than the bottom 90%. Now, whenever you have, so what happened was we went from being a society where no matter who was in charge, whether it was Democrats or Republicans, there was a general sense that we should try to make this country a land of equal opportunity that everybody would basically have a fair shot. And if you're in the club in America, it's a great place to be. The point is not enough people can now get into the club. When you have tens of millions of children who go to schools that where they don't even have the adequate school supplies to teach a child to read, if a child cannot learn to read by the age of eight, the chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased, the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. 
Then what started to happen in the 90s was this incredible explosion of the undue influence of money on our system. So starting in the 80s, it started with the Republicans, but it did not slow down. It slowed down, but did not stop with the Democrats. So by this point, it's this duopoly where, in my opinion, certainly the Republicans are a lot worse, but that doesn't mean the Democrats are pure because the Republicans, uh, the, the Republican Party has been taken over hook, line and sinker by this corporatist mentality. The Democrats contain two elements. On the other hand, there are some corporate interests where both are so beholden to the money from those corporate interests that, as you said, corporations uh, our, our system of government has become a system of legalized bribery where too many public policies do more to increase uh, the short-term profits for huge corporate interests than to increase safety, health, and well-being of people and planet. Now, about the second thing, let me just complete by saying this. It's not, no intelligent observer would argue that we never had racists and we never had anti-Semites and we never had uh, homophobes and we never had is uh, Islamophobes or xenophobes. Of course, we're not enlightened people. So obviously we've always had elements of serious bigotry and racism in the United States. However, back in the 60s, we thought we had reached a point in the 50s and the 60s where there was a general consensus on both left and right that no serious bigot racist, et cetera, would be given a serious megaphone by either major political party. And those levies have fallen and they fell for two reasons. Number one, the advent of social media where even a Nazi can have a platform now. And the fact that we had a president, a person of a, a political, uh, you know, no matter what, I mean, I've made it clear that I don't agree with Ronald Reagan. I didn't agree with George Bush about the Iraq war, but neither one of those people would have knowingly stoked racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, et cetera. It's just, we, this wasn't done. There was, a, there was a center on which we all agreed to agree. And we have now been through the experience of a, of a personage no, of no less power than the president of the United States who would actually exploit those sentiments for political purposes. We were a wounded nation because of it. And it's like the box has been opened. And these forces have just been spewed uh, into our system. And it all goes back to what I said before, many different problems, one answer. And that's really takes us full circle to what we said. If each of us will see this, if each of us will do what we can in our own lives uh, as responsible citizens, but also as people seeking to increase love, then as we were saying to the nice Australian lady, um, it can't take many years. We don't have many years. We, we, it can't be many years. It has to be now. We have to consider the decline of America as an emergency situation, as a crisis. Other generations before us have risen to the occasion. Uh, slavery was followed by abolition. The institutionalized suppression of women was followed by the women's suffragette movement. Uh, institutionalized white supremacy and segregation in the American South was followed by the civil rights movement. And now it's our turn. Other generations rose to the occasion, and uh, I join with all of you the absolute conviction uh, that we can and we will too. Marianne, thanks for your thoughts on all of that. And um, I'm going to bring on now Deb. Deb, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Deb. Hello, um, Marianne, thank you. It's an honor to speak with you and and I thank you for choosing to run for president. Uh, my you. husband and I were so excited to see you in the running. That was thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Um, there, uh, the, the, patriarch, the patriarchy would have really got a blow if you would have been elected, would have loved to have seen that. Um, <laughs> What I have a hard time with in the government these days are the subsidies that we see going to, uh, and I'm a retired USDA employee and embarrassed, so embarrassed of, of the subsidies that go out there and Absolutely. the lobbyists, the lobbyists that promote uh, all these rules and regulations to make the, rule, the rich richer. And it feels powerless to me and the media seems to be in on it because they don't report on these kind of things and I'm just curious if you have 
uh, I feel like the starfish throwing it in the ocean, uh, picking up the starfish and throwing it in the ocean. Is there something that I could do besides writing my congressman, <laughs> as we do on a regular basis? Uh, what would what might help? Okay, well, first of all, your analysis of the situation is 100% correct. It has to do not only uh, with the changes in the corporate rates, it has to do with deregulation, had to do with privatization, and had to do with those corporate subsidies. I'm sure many people on this call right now would be shocked to hear that the oil, the fossil fuel industries that are already, we know what they're doing to destroy the planet, they already have hundreds of billions of dollars in cash lying there, were given $26 billion in subsidies last year. I mean, why? Um, so you are absolutely correct. The government has become handmaiden to this corporate aristocracy. But the only way to repeal bad policies is to place them with different policymakers. The reason we don't have uh, policies that, that ad advocate more for the safety and well-being of the working people of America is because not enough working people of America are making the policies. Once again, how expensive it is to run for office. This is why we must be involved in these elections. Next year, there are midterm elections. If you will go to candidatesummit.com, CandidateSummit.com, you will see uh, congressional candidates who I have endorsed, who do stand for the kind of progressive values that we've been talking about here. Um, we simply must change the people who are making, you know, somebody, when you have, uh, for instance, the United States government having actually negotiated with bar big pharmaceutical companies against itself uh, so that they could not negotiate with those pharmaceutical companies. Those were Congress people and senators who were donated to by those big pharmaceutical companies. But once again, you have to get involved and you have to get involved on the level of the primary. And that means right now, everyone, um, when you have huge corporate forces that can just flood uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars, what's the antidote to this? Hundreds of millions of us who are flooding with $5 and $10 and you know, $15 donations. But all of us have to do what we can. And I hope that you will go to candidate summit.com. Uh, what you're talking about, what this lady just mentioned, uh, having worked at the USDA, is something which is called agency capture. And agents, and I recommend a book by Michael Lewis called The Fifth Risk. So you take something like the USDA, you take something like, um, I'm sure many people remember the Max, the Boeing Max disasters, where all those people died. Why, why were the Boeing Max disasters? Because the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, was looking the other way when Boeing was cut corner, was cutting corners. When you have, um, whether it's the, CD, the CDC or the FDA or the F FCC or any of them, when these agencies that were set up to advocate for us have become, have once again, agency capture so that they're doing more to work. You know, when, under the Trump administration, the head of the EPA was a former oil company lobbyist, a former chemical company lobbyist, who actually were working against environmental protection. That's why they kept repealing environmental protections. You have to get involved. None of this is gonna change unless we get involved. Um, and once again, uh, there are midterm elections next year. Please go to candidatesummit.com and run for office. Think of running for office. Think of, uh, go to your city council meetings. Uh, I know that so many people, you know, it's like, who has the bandwidth? But you know what? We've got to show up for this stuff now. Go to the city council get, meeting. Go to your, uh, see who your state reps are. See what they're doing. This is what we as immune cells in our society must do now. Get yourself involved. And to be honest, it's actually more fun than you might think. Because once you know that it's kind of like watching a... a a uh, soap opera at first you don't know the players and you don't know what they're doing and then after watching it for a week or so you're like oh my god this is happening that's happening get involved that's the you know thomas jefferson was right he said the only safe repository for uh power in this country is in the hands of its people and we have given up too much of that power we bought into the idea that there's this political class and they're going to take care of everything yeah they really took care of everything look where we are 
Thank you, Marianne, for that. And um, we're going to try Benny again. Benny, are you able to unmute now? Let's see if we can make this work. Are you there? Third time's a charm. All right. Hi, Benny. Thank you so much. Marianne, what was the most uplifting or surprising thing you found, learned running for president? And also for those of us still struggling to get to veganism, can you tell us about your path and or roadblocks or obstacles in you possibly returning there? Well, actually, I already told the story about my my efforts uh, and uh, the roadblock. So I feel I've already answered that question. Um, in terms of the uh, the political, I had I would say running for president was equal parts exhilarating and brutal. Um, the political media industrial complex is brutal. Um, they heard me uh, talk about things such as the things we've talked about here and they decided to uh, do whatever it would take to get me out of the conversation. Uh, you couldn't open up a computer that somebody wasn't calling me dangerous and wacko and crazy. And uh, I mean, it was quite something and I'm sure all of you saw it. Um, so they have they decide what they want the conversation to be. And they have decided uh, who they think should be part of that conversation. And they do what it takes uh, to get rid of anybody that they don't want to be in the conversation. And it's only an awakening enough of the people uh, to send money to those candidates, to support those candidates that will enable us to override that. Um, what I found that was exhilarating was talking to voters, which was beyond exhilarating, uh, particularly touching in the primary states, because the voters of Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina are very aware that their votes will make a big difference, not only in this country, but in certain ways in the world. I found the voters intelligent, uh, decent, dignified and and what was sad to me was more than able they were clearly more than able to handle this if the dnc had just kept their fingers off the scale uh, we've seen this in the last two presidential elections george washington warned us in his farewell address he warned us about political parties he said that uh they could become filled with factions of men he said who cared more about their party than about their country and in the, in the history of the United States, third party voices have been extremely important. Uh, the abolition came from the abolitionist party. Women's suffrage came from the women's party. Social security for that matter came from the socialist party. So this two party duopoly is um, obstructive to our democratic process. It does more to thwart than to support the full release of democracy and the, the notion that our founders had of a group conscience where the way the founders saw it, and I agree with this fundamentally, this is radical, it is so profound. They said, if people, if you have a free press, if you have free public education, so people have educated critical thought, if you have a free speech so they can talk, if you have free freedom of assembly, then they won't always come up with the right answer, but more often than not, that it's the only thing to look to as the governing principle. Now that's different than the governing principle of short-term profits for huge corporations that are able to have undue influence on our government. And that is the choice Americans are making today. And you're gonna let the you you're gonna uh, just let the corporations handle it. Good, because don't expect everybody to have health care. Don't expect agriculture to be uh, uh, to be um, healthy. Don't expect all your food to be healthy. Don't expect your water to be healthy. Uh, don't expect your streets to be healthy. Don't expect educational opportunity to be universal. Don't expect enough people to have a shot at a vibrant economy. And don't expect the world to be anything close to peaceful. Thank you for that. And uh, with that, uh, Deb is back with a quick question. Deb, uh, if you can go ahead and unmute. Well, you just about covered it right there. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add one more thing with the media. And uh, just uh, someone mentioned it, not your, your talk, being here, not a part of health, which I strongly disagree. Um, the media and the doctor's hands are tied and we're not getting the true information for our health. And I'm just wondering if um, 
the the monopolies of the media being owned by corporations rather than it used to be back in the day of uh, Walter Cronkite and that sort of thing. It, why there isn't more of a, um, a curb in the monopolies that are going on out there and keeping the media's hands tied. For exactly. Well, reason we said. they aren't tied. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly the reason we said in 1996 under Bill Clinton, uh, that was called the Telecommunications Act. When I was a child, the same company was not allowed to own the television station and the radio station and the newspaper in a in a city. It was because the gov- we we worked to guarantee diversification of information and ideas. With the Telecommunications Act in 1996, what began to happen uh, in telecommunications is the same that's true in agriculture, the same that's true in chemical, same true of food. A few companies who own everything and have this monopolistic influence. So I'll give you an example. When I was young, a reporter would uh, write a story about the the factory downriver that was spewing chemicals that were poisoning the river. And this, this, this article might be so important that it won that reporter a Pulitzer Prize. Today, there's a very good chance that that story that that reporter would be told by the editor, kill it, don't write that story, or even fired for trying to. Why? Because it's a good chance that the same company that owns the Newspaper owns the factory. So these are this is why people talk about anti-monopoly. And this is why you want to read the news. This is why you want to keep up with what's going on. Um, there's a book called Hate Inc. by a gentleman named Map Taibbi, T-A-I-B-B-I. And it's great what he what he writes about that. He writes about how all that happened. Uh, Matt Taibbi is great. This is time to, you know, Americans are very good with a to-do list. You know, just tell us what to do and we'll fix it. You could look at World War II um, uh, and the Nazis and the Japanese Imperial Army like an invasive, like a like an operable tumor, and a former generation per- brilliantly performed invasive surgery and they removed the tumors. What we've got on our hands now is more like cancer that is metastasized because it's an economic mindset that makes a corporate bottom line more important than us. And it's wrapped around some healthy organs because, you know, take something like the opioid crisis. It's not like you don't want there to be pain pills. I mean, I had surgery last year and I got to tell you, I was in excruciating pain for two, for two months. And I'm very grateful that there was Oxycontin. On the other hand, we, there was an $8 billion settlement against Purdue Pharmacy because of predatory pharma, uh, pharmaceutical executives who knowingly, knowingly uh, promulgated the lies about OxyContin that led to the deaths of 450,000 people. So it's not like you want to say you don't want big pharma to be able to operate. You just want there to be safety and health regulations. And that, that goes to vaccines, that goes to uh, painkillers, it goes to antidepressants. Same with energy companies. You know, when you look at something like, uh, well, with, now with these fossil fuel companies, we must make a shift from a dirty economy to a clean economy. Uh, with, with, uh, with our war economy, we have 54 cents of every dollar that is defense industry related. But we could transition from a war economy to a peace economy because the return on investment is greater in education and, uh, and um, infrastructure. But ladies and gentlemen, I think the point here is the, the, these kinds of vibrant health, and it's just like we're talking about with the body. The health, we need to have a health and wellness movement within the larger society. We're talking about the health and the wellness. A society is not healthy where 40, 54 percent of your of your uh, of uh, of your money is has to do with building ways to kill people. A society is not healthy when its energy system is mainly concerned with things that destroy the earth. And once again, if we're going to have a new conversation and vibrant health in the society, it's going to be because of things like this and our talking about what a more healthy society would look like. What would healthy agriculture look like? What would healthy economy look like? 
what would peace building as opposed, as opposed to just war building? Look, we know in health, for instance, we know now, we don't just wait till we get sick and then allopathically seek through external remedy to eradicate or suppress symptoms. We want to proactively create health in order to prevent disease. It should be the same way with war and peace. We should proactively wage peace, proactively do the things like reduction of violence against women, expanded economic opportunities for women, expanded educational opportunities for children that actually statistically increase the chance of peace and decrease violence. Anyway, I, I, I think I've made the points. I think you get it. Uh, we have to become as excited about creating a healthy society as we're excited about creating healthy bodies. And I hope that some of what I said here today um, suggested at least how intimately related the two are. Uh, you certainly have, Marianne. Um, up next, we have Joel. Joel, uh, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, we'd love to have your question. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marianne. I, I, have a, I have a vision and a dream, and I was wondering what your thoughts would be on, on the planting for the health of our mother planet Earth, the planting of 18 billion trees. Just imagine new forests everywhere where trees are per, pulling oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide out of the air, giving us oxygen, holding soil together, and offering food and habitat uh, for, for life. And uh, I'm on a mission to plant trees, Marianne. That's beautiful. Uh, most serious conversation about uh, fighting climate change does include reforestation. I think we also have to remember that in planting trees, it does matter which kinds of trees we plant. It's always good to plant a tree, but too often companies that say, oh, we're gonna, re we're gonna replant are replanting trees that do not carry near the capacity to absorb um, carbon as do the ones that they replace. So we also want to be clear about what kind of trees, but yes, of course, we must reforest. Uh, while we're talking about uh, saving the world in time in terms of the environmental crisis, I would also point out the importance of high-speed rail. Um, people were talking earlier about animal factory farming. This is a huge issue, not only in terms of cruelty to animals, but also in terms of the environment. High-speed rail is an extremely important issue because right now so much of the uh, of the carbon emissions have to do with airplanes and um, and cars and trucks. And China has 22,000 miles of high-speed rail. They have 10 metro systems, whole systems uh, throughout the country, um, 40, uh, 40 of them, I mean, and they have 22,000 more miles under construction. We have just a tiny amount under construction in California. We have a little bit in Florida. So we need to so speed it up on high-speed rail, uh, even in the current infrastructure plan. There's a lot of money spent on re repairing roads that should be spent on uh, repurposing the roads, turning them into tracks for high-speed rails. So, you know, in America, and this is the good thing about America, things change because there's a buzz about something. And I think a lot of people find the subject of a train, you know, not the sexiest thing in the world, but we need to make high-speed rail uh, a sexy uh, conversation. And a couple of people so far today have talked about how the media is in on it. Notice how they don't report much about high-speed rail. Because this is the kind of stuff that's not making it into the mainstream uh, uh, news media narrative the way it should. And that is because it, uh, you know, you've got car companies, for instance. I mean, all the car companies that are advertising on even on news shows, high speed rail is going to really change uh, transportation in the United States. But boy, do we need it. We have nothing compared to what other countries have. And here we're telling people about reducing carbon emissions. Thank you for that, Marianne. I think we have one more, and this is Brad. Brad, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself for Marianne Williamson. 
Um, yeah, you were just talking about uh, the importance of free speech. Um, and so I was wondering what you would think about all the, the social media companies, all their censorship, like alternative methods of cancer. They're getting banned. Anyone who says anything bad about vaccines or, or even if they should ever like censor or ban the president of the United States, even whether you agree or disagree with the president. Excuse me. I was having a conversation on the phone just this morning by a former state attorney general. We were talking about just this. Um, I remember when Sasha Baron Cohen was saying about Trump, how dangerous it was to have Trump on Twitter um, and how, you know, the, the, the phrase that um, Cohen would use, and I think he was right, is that if Hitler were alive today, he would be taking out 30 second ads on Facebook. Um, and so I very much supported the deplatforming of the former president. And I do think the world is a better place without his tweets. Having said so, I also said that I was uncomfortable with exactly what you just said, including Bobby Kennedy Jr. I said, you know, I don't agree with everything Bobby Kennedy Jr. said, but I wanted to read what he was saying. Um, and so you're right. And, and I've talked to a lot of people, where's the point? Where's the point at which, uh, because social media platforms are the new town public square. So it's tough. It's a tough one. It's a tough one because I do think, I, I do support the deplatforming of, of, uh, of, of the president. I felt that he was a powerful agent of hate on the other hand, the deplatforming of so many of these uh, alternative medicine things, I agree with you. And I, and I think, you know, there's a, one of my favorite books is a book by um, Rilke, the poet Rilke, Renier Rilke. And he said, sometimes you don't have the answer. You have to live the difficulty of the question. And that's where I think a lot of us are right now and where we have to be. And that also takes us back to the earlier thing. Don't spend so much time saying what you think other people's answers should be. Think in your own heart. I mean, this is, this is a big question. In a country where the ideal is individual freedom balanced with concern for the collective good, who should be platform, deplatformed and who shouldn't? I know many people who say no one should be deplatformed. On the other hand, like I said, I think the world is better without Donald Trump's tweets. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, there are, you know, I'm Jewish. There are sites out there talking about how to kill Jews. I mean, there were people in Charlottesville, Jews shall not replace us. And what time they were meeting. I, I don't claim to have an answer. I, I do think this, however, we will not get deep answers until we start asking deep questions. The very fact that you ask the question, the very fact that we're here today as citizens together thinking about these things is a good thing, is a good thing. And it is out of that level of deep questioning that wisdom will emerge. And I believe in the American people. We'll go a little bit to this side, get a little bit to this side, but if, if, if democracy is allowed to work, we'll get to the higher answer. I believe that. Thank you for that. And um, we do have one more that's come on, and that is Ellen. Ellen, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Ellen. Oh, Ellen. Uh, we're not hearing you, but I see you're unmuted. Are you there? Hmm. I'm afraid that is not flying, Ellen. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Um, but I guess that's uh, live broadcast, as they say, or webcast, if we will. So, uh, Ellen, please try back another time. Is Thank it better now? Oh, yes, we hear you now, Ellen, in the okay. nick of time. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Now, let me see if I can remember my question. <laughs> um you had talked a little bit about politics and how um, hard it is to do anything about, you know, the USDA and big pharma and the lobbyists. And I just wonder, it, 
what can be done and or is it just too far gone it's not too far gone uh we're close to the cliff but we didn't go over it we're way too close to it but absolutely once again i hope you'll go to candidate summit.com i hope that you will you know five dollars even if it's just five dollars, I hope you will. If if you see a candidate, all I can assure you that all of the candidates on that list that I've endorsed and will be endorsing in the future believe as we do about these issues. Okay, now don't think that if you live in Florida and the candidates in Illinois that it is not relevant to you. It is because it's all about math. It's all about having enough people in Congress who represent a certain consciousness to have a a, a real power in terms of votes. So that's something I urge you. Uh, the, we have midterms next year. And the important thing is to get in on the level of these primaries, because you can't just say, oh, one party or the other, I'll vote for them. It's on the level of the primary that we're talking about whether people who are taking a stand against corporate control are trying to run and they're usually people who don't have a lot of financial backing for good reason. So they need us. I hope you will go to candidatesummit.com. And I am working very hard, uh, not only in finding these candidates, but vetting them. And they're really fantastic people. And you will see there the, the summit we did the other night, each one used taking four minutes to share their opinions. It's very touching. I hope you will look. And like I said, I hope uh, you will get involved in your own communities. Uh, and some of you perhaps might be thinking about running for office yourself. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. I just want to remind everybody that um, in just over an hour from now at 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have our panel discussion with Brian Clement, Anna Maria Clement, and Will Tuttle. It is not to be missed. Please come back and join us then. However, Right now, we do want to remind you to go for more information about Mary Ann Williamson, her activities, her programs, her books, all things Mary Ann. Go visit maryann.com. Um, obviously, I mentioned at the beginning of this thing, I'm reading one of her books right now. It's, it's a difference maker for myself. So oh, I, thank you. I, I thank you. So like I said, a friend gifted it to me and it's one of the greatest gifts. So. It's uh, you were, you picked it up. It was a uh, law of divine compensation, right? Yes. Yes. And, and I will say that so much of what you mentioned in today's lecture was in there and it's, uh, it's life changing for me. So I so appreciate that. Thank it's you. not about me, but I just, as a personal testimonial. Um, and I, and I want to say, you know, I want to thank you for everything that you've shared here today. What seems so, it's seemingly uh, uh, fundamental on some levels and the way you've placed it and positioned it for us is so incredibly profound. And I really hope that landed with everybody. And I know I wanna thank you. And um, I, I wanna ask our uh, tech team to go ahead and unmute everyone because I know a lot of people wanna thank you as well. So thank you, Marianne. Please thank everybody you. join me in and thanking Marianne Williamson. Thank and you, for being a stand yeah, Thank you, Marianne. 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 Thank you, Marianne.